cars. And the reason cars are a useful analogy is because cars are machines. And let's remember the human body is a machine. It's an awfully complicated machine, but it's still a machine. Therefore, if we look at the ways in which we can already succeed in extending the functioning, healthy lifespan of simple man-made machines, such as cars, then we might well get some ideas for how we might do the same to a much more complicated machine, such as the human body. Now, here is a car that is more than 50 years old. That's probably three or four times as long as your average car lasts before you junk it and go and get a new one. And the reason it's lasted so long is because it was built that way, with corrosion-resistant metal and really, you know, um, strong tires and all those things. Um, so this is the similar reason to why the human body lasts so much longer than the body of a mouse or a dog. But it was built that way. And those of us who have the misfortune to be already alive don't have much choice about the way we're built. So the question is, is there an alternative? And of course there is, and that's why I'm saying B.W. Bugs up there, I could have said Morris Miners, for example. The reason I said that is because there are just as many B.W. Bugs, 50 years old, driving around the streets of the world as there are 50 year old Land Rovers. And the reason why there are so many is not because B.W. Bugs were built to last. It's because they've got style, sufficient style that their owners fell in love with them and have done an exceptional amount of maintenance to them over the years. This car was built in the same year as the car on the previous slide, and it's doing fine, and that's why. So, essentially what I'm saying here is that long-lived cars of this sort, and indeed long-lived many other types of machines, are very powerful existence proofs that maintenance works just so long as you do it comprehensively enough. We all do some maintenance on our car, we take them into the garage, we get them through their MIT every year, but we don't do the sort of comprehensive maintenance that gets that this car has been getting over the years. And the difference, as you can see, is rather profound in terms of the overall outcome. So if we now go back to aging, and we ask, well, what does that mean in terms of intervention? What it essentially means is that there is a third, completely different approach to the combating of aging, which is the one that I favor and want to explore for the rest of this talk. I call it the maintenance approach, we could call it the um, engineering approach, you know, the whatever, something like that. Um, the idea here is simply that we do not try to intervene in this process where, whereby metabolism lays down these various types of damage in the first place. We also don't try to intervene in the process whereby damage causes the ill health of old age, pathology of old age. What we do is we attack the damage itself, we let it be laid down and we go and get rid of it. Not necessarily particularly completely, but fairly well, so that we can keep the overall level of damage down below the level that causes pathology. Now, why is that promising? Well, it's promising for a very simple reason, or perhaps two reasons, namely that it avoids the drawbacks of the other two approaches that I just summarized to you. First of all, since by definition, damage consists of the ongoing, lifelong molecular and cellular changes that happen as a result of metabolism, by definition, damage does not have accumulating precursors. Therefore, the problem that the maintenance approach addresses is not a problem that's inherently going to get worse as people get older. That's very good news in the first place. It avoids this, if you like, the downward spiral that is the problem of the geriatric approach. Oh, also, it avoids the problem of the gerontology approach. Because here what we're doing is we're saying, let's let metabolism lay down these various types of damage and furthermore, let's let it do so at the rate that it naturally does so. Let's let that happen and let's just go in and fix up the damage after it occurs. Now, that is an enormously helpful thing because essentially what it means is that we are sidestepping our ignorance of metabolism. If we're going to actually let metabolism do what it was evolved to do, then we don't have to understand it very well. All we have to do is understand the damage itself, characterize the damage and figure out the ways to repair it. And of course, damage by definition only eventually causes pathology, which is to say that until it becomes sufficiently abundant, it's basically harmless, it's inert. It's not participating in metabolism, it's just hanging out, gradually accumulating, and uh, like a ticking time bomb, but it's not actually participating in the chemical and cellular reactions that constitute metabolism. So interfering with it directly by this approach it's likely to be much easier to do without serious side effects than intervening in metabolism itself would be. So, okay, well that was all terribly abstract and theoretical, and you may be wondering whether this actually means anything in, in concrete biological terms, so it's about time I told you that it does. 
Um, I've, I've so far told you one reason why this approach, the maintenance approach, is so promising. Namely, it seems to target the, the weak link in, in, in the process of aging. But there's a second reason, a very important second reason, which is that damage is not so complicated as either its cause, its metabolism, or its consequences, pathology. This is a complete, I claim, characterization of damage. I claim that everything, every phenomenon that goes on in the body that qualifies as damage by the definition I'm using today fits into one or other of these categories. So I'm saying things like indigestible molecules, molecules that are created as byproducts of metabolism and then for whatever reason the cell doesn't have mechanisms for either breaking them down or excreting them. So this, this stuff accumulates inside the cell. Um, and that's fine for a long time and eventually there's so much of it it does go <coughs> away. Um, too few cells, in other words, cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division and differentiation of other cells. You got the idea. Essentially large categories, obviously, but nevertheless well-defined, biologically meaningful categories of phenomena. I'll be getting on in a moment to explaining why this particular categorization is useful, but the point is here, it's a very concrete categorization. Now, I've already made a couple of outrageous statements today. Um, but I want to justify briefly the one that I've just made, namely that this is an exhaustive classification of the problem of damage. And there are a couple of ways that one can do that. One can first of all just take a biological approach and say, well, okay, what could damage be? And the first thing that one can say in answering that is simply that damage can only accumulate in long-lived structures. Remember, damage by definition is accumulating problems. Now, if a protein, for example, is synthesized in the cell and it doesn't go for a while and then it gets oxidized and it gets broken down and the undamaged amino acids are reused and the damaged ones are excreted, then that doesn't count as damage because it's not accumulating. The damage is gone. So it's got to be long-lived structures that, that, um, that accumulate damage. And then you can just look at the body. You can say, okay, well, what, what are we made of? We're made of you know, cells and stuff between cells. Uh, what are cells made of, and so on. And you can say, well, okay, what can damage accumulate in? And you get more or less this list. There's a second way of um, convincing ourselves that this is probably a comprehensive list, and it's a um, circumstantial one, but I think also quite a powerful one. Um, it's simply that it's been the same list for more than a quarter of a century. <coughs> Gerontologists have been looking at this problem, some, some of them not necessarily in this way, but nevertheless at this problem, for an awfully long time, and all of the seven types of phenomenon have been discussed extensively by people who study the biology of aging as potential major contributors to the eventual ill health of old age uh, for, since at least 1982 and in many cases a lot longer ago than that. So, you know, we've come a long way in that period in terms of our ability to analyze biological systems and figure out what they're doing and all that. And so you would have expected that we would be coming up with some more to add to this list if there were any more to be found. But that's pretty good news, isn't it? But here's the really good news. I think that we know, at least in principle, how 